I was thinking for a long time how to start this video because it needs to be concise and compendious, but I also want it to be very, very comprehensive. And I guess the best place to start is at the beginning. Uh, there's been many different versions of my life story which have been put on the internet as of late and from many years ago. But I'm gonna give a very, very quick overview of my story. My life has always been difficult. I've certainly had a difficult life. I preach to the people who follow me that as a man, trauma and difficulty is extremely important because it's the building blocks for mental fortitude and physical fortitude. So I'm very, very happy that my life has been difficult because it's impossible to become a capable man or of man of my capability without struggling with facing serious adversities, without trying to overcome often insurmountable odds. I grew up in South side of Chicago. I'm obviously a person of color. I uh, was bullied in school to a degree. And my father always taught me to stick up for myself. I was never allowed to run and cry to authority. I was told that if someone wants to mess with you or come at you, you can't always go tell the teacher. Sometimes you have to deal with it. I was actually picked on by these two, these two kids when I was riding the school bus home. I think I was around five and they were around seven. They were a bit older than me and they used to pick, it, pick on me on the school bus. They'd sit behind me, throw things at me, hit me, etc. And I came home and I told my dad about it. I said, dad, these two kids are picking on me every single time I get the school bus, I don't know what to do. And my dad said, I'm not gonna call the teacher because the teacher ain't on the bus. And I'm not gonna call the school bus driver because they're busy driving. Son, if you wanna deal with this, you're gonna have to deal with it yourself. And I said, but dad, they're bigger than me. I, what do you want me to do? There's two of them and they're bigger than me. And at the time I'd just come home from school and I was holding a lunchbox. My dad pointed and said, you have a lunchbox, son. Teach them. So weeks had passed. It was a few weeks. They kept picking on me, kept picking on me. And I felt myself sitting there getting more insecure and the rage was boiling inside of me. And one day one of them slapped me in the side of the face from behind. I was sitting on the chair, he slapped me in the face from behind. And instantly, I don't know what it was, but this was the day I had enough. And I turned with my lunchbox and swung it over the back of the school bus chair and caught him and busted his eye clean open. The plastic Batman lunchbox hit him in the eye and blood started squirting everywhere. All the children started screaming. And as I did this, the bus had just come up to a stop. It was a few stops before my stop, but it had stopped. And as the bus stopped and the screaming happened, I just got up and I ran and I just ran off the bus and ran home. I've never run so fast or so far in my life. I was full of adrenaline. I just ran, 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 ran. When I got home, I had blood on my clothes and my dad looked at me. He said, what happened? And I said, that kid, I won't say his name. I said his name at the time. I said, that kid, he hit me in the face and I, I just, I had enough of getting hit in the face. And I was still holding the lunchbox, but it was all smashed up where I'd hit him with it. And my dad kind of smiled a little bit and said, don't worry, son, get in the car. We got in the car and we went to Walmart. We walked up and down the aisle and he looked and picked up another lunchbox, an exact replica of the same blue Batman lunchbox, gave it to me and said, I'll buy you as many of these as you need. And that was the last we spoke of it. Funnily enough, I never saw that kid again. I don't know if he changed schools. I don't know what his parents did, but I never saw that child again. So, even from a very, very young age, I was taught that going to authority and crying and hoping someone else is going to fix your problems is not the way a man should conduct himself. When I left Chicago, I moved to Luton, England, which was multiple times voted the worst town in England. It's a high crime rate. It's a very bad area. Uh, my mother and father broke up, so I was in a single mother household. And now I'm a person of color in a single mother household. I'm also the only American at the time um, in, in Luton. And I had, again, repeat problems in school. I was picked on for being the only American. I was picked on for not knowing things I should have known because I hadn't been through the English educational system. I'd been through the American educational system. And I had trouble in school again, but I stuck up for myself. Unfortunately, nothing got violent at any point. But when people made fun of me, I stood up and said, listen, don't make fun of me. I'm from a different place and I talk differently. And I always understood 
that standing up for yourself. I never went to the teacher. I never cried to anybody else. I just stood up for myself. And over time, people learned respect for me and my boundaries. And they were very respectful of me. And I had a very positive experience from then on out in school by simply standing up for myself because this is how I was taught to act. In high school, I ended up having a reputation of a guy that nobody really messed with. I certainly wasn't a bully, absolutely the opposite, but no one really picked on me. I actually had a friend in school who was gay. Uh, I had five main friends in school and I was also friends with a gay guy. And he would make fun of me for being American and I would make fun of him for being gay back then. But the world was a very, very different place. This is many, many years ago. And we had friendly banter back and forth, but we were very good friends. And I stuck up for him and prevented anyone else picking on him all of the time. And the banter between us, the locker room talk, which would be considered absolutely unacceptable today, at the time was very, very normal. And we had a great time. We were good friends. And I heard from him, actually, after this ban. And he said, you should mention the fact that the things they say about you completely aren't true. And this leads me on to the reason I believe these narratives have managed to gain such a foothold in popular consciousness. Due to the fact I've managed to develop an iron mind, because I'm probably the only individual on earth who can be vilified to this level without taking personal insult and without being emotionally affected, what I've done is I've allowed certain narratives to gain traction, which I shouldn't have allowed to gain traction because they didn't personally bother me because I know they are false. I live with a very, very pure heart. I'm a religious man. I go to church and anyone who follows me in detail knows I donate huge sums of money to the church. And as long as I knew the truth of my heart and God knew the truth of my heart, I wasn't interested in lies being purported. I now understand that that's wrong because even though I've done nothing wrong, even though it doesn't emotionally affect me, even though God and myself know up my innocence, the public consciousness has been polluted to a point where narratives are being purported which are absolutely and utterly false. And it's having a genuine negative impact on the people who I care about and the people who care about me. And despite the fact it doesn't emotionally affect me, as a man, I have a duty to protect all of those I love. And for this reason, these narratives have started to become very, very harmful. I was on the understanding that on the internet, people don't like you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you say. There's going to be some people who don't like you. And the people who don't like you are not interested to latch on to and accelerating that lie on as much as possible via their platforms to try and paint a negative picture of you because they don't like you. A lot of these attacks against me are disguised under the virtue of caring about women. But none of these people who are attacking me care about women. None of them donate to women's charities. None of them donate to charity like I do. None of them help anybody like this video. Proof of the massive work I do for helping people. They don't help anybody. All they do is just attack me and use fake virtue, the fact they pretend to care, as a reason to attack somebody who they personally don't like. And it's very, very different to actually care about an issue or weaponize an issue and pretend to care to try and damage someone else's life. These are very, very different things. And this is the reason why I have not tried to dispel these myths as hard as I could have, because I understood that these people are always going to hate me and they're always going to lie about me, no matter what I say or do. But considering in light of the final ban and considering I have the public consciousness, I think it's extremely important that for myself and for my family and for people I care about, that I tell the truth. And I make the truth known to the world because that is the only intention in my video is to sit and tell the truth. And the fact that I'm a very, very iron-minded individual who is not negatively affected by these smear campaigns is not reason enough for me not to sit, take time, and dispel all the negative things which are said about.